Hello gang, your pal K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. Well, I'm getting closer and closer to my studio. I've moved into my new house, but my furniture is still not here. I'm in a bare room, hence the echo effect. I'm getting there. Excited about that and continuing my series on Dungeon of the Mad Mages Level 2. Last week I redrew the map. Uh, explaining that I like to redraw the map, whether I'm going virtual tabletop, whether I'm at a tabletop, but I'm going to take those rooms and you know redraw them on a dry erase mat, or even if I'm going to do a you know theater of the mind thing, I want to know what's in these rooms, what they look like, so that if there are encounters, my explanations make sense. And this is the reason today's video, as I promised, was going to be on putting objects in the room. If you look at the map in the book, it's just blank. They describe these objects, but where are they exactly? And what do they mean when the players enter the room? What do they see? How much does this, you know, obstruct uh, their movement? Um, they have an encounter, you know, difficult terrain. And also it gives you a sense of what the players not just see, but hear, you know, smell, uh, possibly even taste when they're moving around the dungeon. Now, as you'll see when I bring up my map, I have put almost all the objects already in there. I'm going to do one room. I'm going to show you how in Dungeon Draft, which is the software I use, how to look for item, you know, objects in there that match what's being described, how to possibly use prefabs, which are collections of objects, how you can make your own prefabs, you know, divide them up and whatnot. But most of these are already in there. I'm just going to talk about them in terms of the players entering, what sort of obstacles they might have uh, in terms of lighting effects and this sort of thing. The next video will actually, I'm going to go into some of these, uh, you know, villains and, you know, resource drain areas and exiting and entering the map in much more detail. But first, let's put objects in our Dungeon of the Mad Mage Level 2. So here is the Dungeon of the Mad Mage Level 2 that I ended with on my last video. It was drawn, if we look at the uh, original uh, JPEG that I used, it pretty much lines up to that. I used the snap on these so I could get it as close as I could to the original. But I don't have any uh, indicators to any of the room numbers that correspond uh, to the descriptions in the book or secret doors. Uh, what I would do for that, I don't want the players to, to see that necessarily, I would create another layer uh, which I have here, and we call numbers. I would just make a clone of this layer and have the numbers. And if we go to that layer, there you see now the numbers are there. Now also there are objects there because I went through this and put these objects in. I'm not going to go through and hunt those. I'm going to do one example and then talk about these with that example. Notice there are the secret doors. Then when I have all my objects and my numbers, because I need these numbers, you know, when I'm looking up what's in the various rooms, I just want to have that on there. What you can do is when you're making this, you can put those objects, you can just have your layer uh, trace image on and use that instead and then clone it, which might be the way. But just for this example, I wanted to be able to see these uh, as I did this. Okay, so, and then eventually what I'm gonna do is I'll make another clone level, uh, as you'll see at the end of this uh, description, uh, for the players and I'll get rid of all these uh, numbers and of course the secret doors. All right now the thing is as I mentioned in my intro this is where the players are going to come up from level one and they're either going to go this direction here to 1a or down here to 2a and you know the, the, the question is what's going to lure them what's going to well if we look at over here in 1d and 1b 1b up here uh, there are goblins preparing this stage to sell things on. And we have these market, you know, these stalls that I'm about to put in here. That is going to make a lot of noise. That's going to be a lot of activity. If we look uh, at 2A is where this calabash has been trapped. And it's back in here, over here. You've got this old uh, water pump here. Uh, you might have some activity uh, here in room 3, which is the puppet room you know, this animated animatronic puppet of Hallister. But, you know, so the, probably the players, unless they want to avoid the noise, might be drawn to this. And I think that's why it is listed as one. But I'm going to just fill room 1D to show you in terms of using uh, the object tool in Dungeon Draft when you have a description. Now, this, this is called Market Hall. 
And basically what it says is you have, if we look here, we can see where they are on our trace image. You have these pillars right in here. Then you're going to have market stalls in here and here, and then you're going to have a throne up here. So in terms of making the objects, we can just go to our objects. We can always uh, search for, say, pillars. Okay, here's some pillars. What do we want to use? Do you want to be fancy? Do you want to be simple? Whatever you want here. Let's just go with this. And I'm going to place these. You can snap down here so that it's right in the center and recreate those pillars. Okay, simple, right? And of course, if always, if you want to move something, select it, you can select, move it like that. Control Z will take it back. All of them. Uh, you can scale those if you want to control Z will go right back. All right, and then once I've done that, I'm going to turn off my trace image. Okay, now what it says here is that, first of all, even though this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you'd think this would have 90 foot ceilings because that's what it says in the setup, everything corresponds, but in fact, they are 60. I think part of that is that you have this narrower section here. Uh, these are supporting this out here. You have a throne back here where this uh, goblin who's been trans uh, called Yek, uh, he has this item that's transformed him into a humanoid, as we'll talk about once we start talking about the composition of forces. But he's up in here in this throne, and then we have these market stalls down here. There are 22 goblins in this room. As I said, I only put inanimate objects. Those will be placed either on the virtual tabletop uh, with tokens, or if I draw this out on a grease uh, paper with uh, with figures type thing uh, in a tabletop game or just theater of the mind. Okay, but what I want to search for then, I go to my objects. I'm going to do the throne first. It says the throne is on uh, a pedestal. Uh, if I go up here and say, what do I have for throne? Uh, I don't have anything. It does have skulls and stuff around, which is cool. It does say that. So let's say he has like a animal print on here. Uh, maybe I'll just do that one. And how big should this be? It's on a thing. I'm going to turn the snap off. Uh, let's say maybe a little bigger like so. He also does have piles of uh, skulls around of various victims. You know, maybe a, uh, a skeleton or something that he's killed. He's sitting there, but of course it's supposed to be raised on a dais. So what I think I will do is I will go to, maybe I'll go back to pillar. Pillars. And maybe I'll make a dais out of that. Maybe like this. Go like this, and then I'll say under, and I'll just grow that a little bit. And even, that's pretty amazing. Okay, so there we've got this giant altar, giant chair where Yek looks over his minions. Another way to do this is to go to your prefabs right here, this button here, and we'll say market has a grain tape. Like this, what's on this? And if I select it, it's all together. That's the prefab until I separate it. This is a table. Uh, this scale is a bit big. There's supposed to be eight of these in this room. So maybe I'll make it. These are 10-foot squares. Maybe that thing is 10 feet. Maybe it's up against the pillars. I think maybe they're going to give themselves some room here to walk back and forth. So I'll just set that there. And, and of course, with this, you can... Uh, it moves around by itself. If you either, you can either separate this or if you copy it, control C and then make a copy. When you turn that off, it's now individual items. And you can, you can alter these and you can add uh, items to this. Here's another example of something with the prefab. If I go to uh, the examples and I say market set. Now this is really large. So I may want to come up here to somewhere and kind of set it is separate that and look at, I've got these tables. I can take them like so. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna make those a little smaller. 
Still got my grid, so that's 10 feet worth of tables. So I can move that over to here. And I can rotate that around. And again, uh, where do I want that? Do I want it? Let's see. Maybe down like in here. And you just make that bigger. Okay, these are individual items, right? And you can take these and you can and say, oh, I want that to be the same size as that. You just take it all. You can also, when you grab this individual one, you can make it into a, you can put it under carts. You can put it under uh, market and call it, you know, uh, food table, except now when I go to my prefab and I go to market, I now have a food table as a prefab. So you can be making these all the time. You can reconstruct them however you want. So one of the things that I might do here, okay. Then I'm gonna go back up. I've got some more stuff. This is obviously very familiar. Uh, this is another one. I'll just grab that. Uh, maybe I'll make that into a prefab under market. And I'll call that, uh, looks like a tanning, tannery table. Oops. Except, grab that, come on, bring it down, turn that, scale it, like so. Okay. It's a prefab. It's not individual, right? So I can totally control that. And if I go to my list now, market, there's the tannery table. Again, it's the scale. If I want to uh, make that smaller, I got to save it smaller. Okay. So now I've got, there's supposedly eight of these tables here, right? Uh, of, of these booths. Now, are these more than one? You know, you decide that it's all just what you want and you can play with these as you want. What does this do? What it does is, and I'll just make, I'll just go, and I'll put one up here maybe. And maybe I'll grab the tannery, control CV. Now, because I did that, I didn't pick it as a prefab. When I go and I look at it, there's individual items. Whereas when you grab that prefab, uh, mark it, tannery and you place it, okay, it's always going to be that, right? It's going to be let's select all. Oh, whereas this, once I've copied it, okay, just something to think about. So maybe I would get rid of, well, but you know, that's it. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, maybe another one over here, maybe. Again, maybe you want that sort of, you know, the goblins don't really aren't, aren't that well organized. Uh, maybe one down in here. Yeah, maybe maybe a smaller one. They don't have to all be identical. Maybe this is some ragtag group of got yeah, yeah. Okay. So now you've got you've got a sense of when the players come into this room. What do they see? Where are the obstacles? Where do they have to maneuver themselves if they're going to get into a fight with the goblins? When we look at this, as I talked about, you're going to hear things. The players come down. They're going to potentially hear all this activity going here where they're building this stage. Uh, here in 1C, you've got a bunch of these uh, gibbets hanging from wood. One of them has Glam, this goblin that's been managed. She's wailing away. She hasn't eaten in two days. That's going to be echoing the hammering and whatnot. So the players are probably going to come this way. It says in 1A that there is uh, trash and debris. Uh, and that you, that you can hear the banging noises. I would assume you can hear these out here. Uh, nothing of any interest in this trash and debris. If you want to place this 
Suppose you want to put that something like this to, it's hard, you have to go through here, that's difficult terrain or something. That's what you want to think about when you're placing this debris. Would they place that right where they're walking? I don't think so. I think there'd be natural paths, but you can certainly do that. A point of order here, there, it says in the book that they're just creating this stage to sell merchandise and slaves. In my campaign, lawful uh, player characters, classes, humanoids of all types and neutral ones are opposed to slavery. We don't have it. Uh, the lawful creatures say all uh, humanoids have uh, uh, rights as humans not to be subjugated to be the property of someone else. The neutral characters think that this is it goes against the balance of life. Creatures should be free to decide their own fate. Uh, only evil creatures have uh, slaves, which of course goblins, that's fine with them. Just a point of order because my players tend to say well, we're not going to allow any slave auction or have people with slaves. You can say, well, hey, Xanathar has his minions which are like slaves, but again, Xanathar is evil and these have been charmed. And then here you have Yek's treasure room. Uh, he's got up here this chessboard that's worth 25. It's an ivory chessboard. I've got a checker thing there, although you could say that's the above of the chessboard. He's got a treasure chest with 2,000 silver. And then he's got this stuffed diorama, a beholder and six goblins. I just put these statues up here uh, as placeholders uh, just to show how much room this diorama might take. All right, and in this room here, this is also one... Uh, where the, uh, you know, yek lines on these, you know, cushions here, and then these moldy cushions are various goblins. Another feature you have, it says explicitly in here that you have these torches that are throwing light. And the way to do that is the light tool, and you center that light. I'm going to make that very slight light. Just like that. Maybe a little stronger. Just because I just like. You don't have to do this at all, obviously, but you know, if it says it's light in there, you may want to do that. All right, and that's your basic first, you know, group here. Yek, the goblin turned human, and his, you know, uh, motley crew. Uh, selling. So if you look over here, this is the, the section two. This is where you have this Calabash, one of Hallister's apprentices. This is one of the features of this level. He has all these apprentices that have, you know, gone insane. Uh, Halabash, I'm sorry, Calabash is trapped in this pocket dimension. Uh, so you have here uh, this well here. Maybe I'll move that number off that so I can see that. You have this old, well, and these are these things, you know, in terms of looking at this dungeon, in terms of your own ideas, having stuff like this is really interesting. Where you have a well, um, you know, you can get 1d4 plus 1 gallons of potable water out of this. Uh, then you have this abandoned laboratory, uh, all these tools and alchemical stuff, trash everywhere. And uh, you have here this wizard's kitchen down here. And of course, in this pot in the center, a specter will rise up when the players enter. Uh, these various, there's four of these pots that become animated pots and pans that attack the players. Uh, and then you have Calabash's bedroom here. And you have this summoning circle underneath the rug. If we look here, there is a summoning circle there under the rug. And once it's slightly uncompleted, I couldn't quite draw it on this, uh, if the players recognize that, you got to describe that as incomplete. If the players do that, they have a chance of uh, uh, finding uh, Calabash there. Uh, the only item is a spell book. And I forgot there's supposed to be a chest in here. So I will say all chest. And we'll just put a chest somewhere in here. A little bit bigger. And the chest has a trap on it, bolt of lightning, 10, uh, 3D6 bolt of lightning. Now, room number three is supposedly difficult to enter because there is furniture piled at each doorway. So I'm going to do that. There's a couple ways to do that. But I kind of like the broken up, smashed up furniture. For some reason, I just feel like this would be all just crappy stuff. You know, just like. 
an old bed that's just screwed up. And of course, you might also want to have clutter, you know, piled up in the various parts of this room. What this does when you do this is it makes it difficult potential terrain when the players, if they start interacting with Pallister's puppet that's on the table. Uh, here in room four, you have the remains of one of Xanathar's an abandoned camp of the Xanathar Guild. So you've got trash in either corner. You've also got um, a, uh, a fire pit where things, and you also have the corpses of three bugbears and an intellect devourer that are heaped in the northeast corner. Here we have a secret door leading to a gate. Uh, this gate is only usable uh, by creatures who are, uh, I believe, eighth level or higher. This is all because of a Jaziria Kesselharp has placed this on here. And again, a secret door. Uh, it's conceivable the players would move here, see this, come down, not necessarily say, well, wait a minute, there should be a secret door there. And then finally, this long hallway comes into room number six. That is a harpsichord in the middle of the room. Uh, within the players can figure out the uh, with a performance check what to play there. And hidden inside is a scroll of raised dead. Very powerful item. You know, if your players, depending on how deadly your campaign is, you know, this could be a very useful item, right? On a failed check, you have to make a con throw. And you not only take 40, 10 necrotic damage, but the flesh of the hands of those that dare try to play this harpsichord are now bone bleached one. So the Raised Dead Scroll has a nasty trap. So section seven is kind of interesting. Again, you can run into this fairly quickly. If the players come down here, they go through the well and they come this way. There's a doorway leading to this section. So they can run into this. Then maybe they want to avoid the noise that they hear up here. And this is a new apprentice of, uh, of Hallister Tenzia. And you, one of the things they say is it smells of ozone and rotting flesh. What do the players not only see, but what do they smell? What do they hear? And here they get the rotting flesh. In A, you just have you know, old odd metal instruments and whatnot. And I placed those here, but you could certainly you know, if you wanted to make them into more obstacles, these are quite large. I could maybe make them a little smaller. All right, oops, I took the whole thing here. However you want to do that, right, for the players, you know, just to, and they're going to spend time looking through these things. There is a little scrap of paper that talks about, you know, Halister has allowed me to come through here. Here's an interesting thing, too. We have these barrels here, and uh, three are empty. Three contain copper ore, and then six have a ghoul inside. Anytime you touch any of the barrels, the ghouls will burst forth and attack the players. Now, right here, you have a copper-plated door because this is the coppered floored room where Trenzia does her experiments. And what you have is a, a lightning uh, skull that floats around the room. There's a flesh golem in here. And then this is a shoot, I just made this red, this shoots down into 13A. So what you're going to want to do with this is you're going to want to decide which of these is the ones that the ghouls are in. The one thing to do is to... Okay, then you go move. And this is going to be on your level where you decide where these ghouls are. And in theory, if the players don't decide to touch, maybe they just investigate this, the hammock and some of this stuff, and they don't touch these, nothing's going to happen. When they go to 7C, this is where you have, as I said, Gollum, this shoot. And this is where Trenzia herself, she was convinced Halister why, I guess she went insane, to make her into a flame skull. Uh, but she does have some nasty abilities, and uh, this is where she dwells. When you get down into here, you've got all this mining equipment that's been left around in seven, and you got three ghasts that are waiting behind the door for anyone that comes in. And then way over here, and again, where do you want to put this? It says 7E, a scrap of paper, uh, and it just talks about, uh, you know, the fact that she created these lightnings. It's not that significant. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do later. Eight is just a hallway that has frescoes on it. It has nothing significant in it. It's uh, animated. 
the dwarves wave, and these dwarves, they don't do anything. So up in 9A, it says that there are two bugbears, and then there are five poison dart traps. It says they're marked on the wall, but when I look at this, and I go to the trace image, I don't see those marked. I can even move that slightly. I don't see anything there, right? So I would just say I'm going to just put them wherever I want. Uh, I'm going to use maybe a, uh, uh, let's say, dart. Let's see. Uh, and then I'll just move them. And maybe I'll just... You know, right down the hall here like this. Uh, pressure plates. Here's where the poison darts come out at the players. And obviously, it's not going to be on their map. When we get into 9B and 9C, this is this Shun's gang where we have this Xanathar, Shun the Spider Eyes, Shurith, uh, this, and uh, some intellect devourers. Uh, as always, these intellect of ours, we saw them on the first level of uh, the Mad Mage. And basically, she is a high pr the drow priestess of uh, Lolf. Whatever you think in terms of the drow, they've made some changes since this was written back in 2018. But what you see in Shul's Lair is lots of clutter, lots of barrels. Uh, we've got some dressers here. These are cots, I believe. Uh, all sorts of clutter here, all sorts of opportunities and I just cluttered this up this way. You can do it whichever way you want. But this is the thing. When you put stuff in these rooms, now you've got an opportunity uh, to create a difficult movement and a battle situation. So 10A, this is the, you know, this the, section 10 is the ooze temple. You know, you've got a gelatinous cube uh, trapped in here. Uh, you've got a flooded room here uh, in which uh, there's uh, 24,000 cubic feet of salt water. Uh, if, if you open this door, it floods 10A. Uh, you get caught in the deluge. You take bludgeoning damage. And the other interesting thing here in 10, this is an ochre jelly that's trapped in here. The other interesting thing in terms of the construction, you've got this collapsed room in which uh, tunnels have been dug to gain access. And this is one of the things I kind of like about uh, this level, where you have these tunnel sections in here that provide access that weren't necessarily uh, originally uh, designed. Here's another great room, 11B. This is where you have uh, Midna Tarberth, uh, uh, priest of Shar, uh, relaxing in her chairs uh, with her underlings. And, you know, she, uh, she is a, a, a NPC who's found this area and decided to live here. Again, this sort of, uh, why would someone live under here? I'm not quite sure, but there she is. Now, 13G is interesting because you have a battle going on, right? This is the, you know, uh, an active dungeon, a dynamic dungeon. Uh, you have this wounded warrior, Rex the Hammer, who, you know, turns out to be evil, but you've got a Mezaloth and two Nothics. Uh, the players come along, and you have all this ore uh, in these this mining stuff. Uh, Rex is damaged, obviously. He's, he's about to be killed when the players come in, and they've got to fight them depending on where you place these how much clutter is here? You could certainly, you know, have plenty more. You know, if you copy this, uh, let's say just copy this, and you're just going to start, you know, really uh, making this a mess in here. I don't know, you know, really making this hard to hard to navigate, right? How much you want to do that, you know, is up to you. But this is the thing about having stuff in these rooms. This would be a difficult room to get around it. And, and this might be too much, but that's what's cool about this. 13B, you have this wall of skulls here. Uh, it's an eight-foot-high, two-foot-thick uh, wall of hobgoblin skeletons, right? And where it goes all the way up to the ceiling. I made this, obviously, quite a bit thicker uh, just because I thought, well, it would fall down if not. But that blocks access to this area. Here in the 13C and D, you have these uh, washrooms, right? And you do have, I think in E, you've got four Nothics that are dwelling in here. Here in 14 A and B, right, we've got this uh, uh, base of a uh, Drown Mage Rizral. So he's got his area here. He also has his underlings in here. Here are their cots and whatnot. If you want to put junk in here, whether what people are living there, that's up to you. Uh, but again, this... Uh, with the table and stuff, and this was taken from another uh, 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 prefab. 
Here we have torches. I did not put the lighting in. What it says is that uh, there's a rust monster fighting over a uh, steel helmet, and these they can't uh, they can't get up onto these torches. And I, these torches are not lit, right? So this is you can distract the rust monsters if you grab one. Here we have a 19C spider web. This is a spider lair. Obviously, you've got to burn your way through here or risk getting caught. And in here we have two chandeliers that have fallen to the floor, and under one of them is the corpse of a spider. And down in here we have a dead spider with a bed. And of course, here you have your animated ballistas that are going to shoot at the players. Uh, in 22A, you've got this uh, pillar of the ale where they have all these spigots around here. In here, you've got these carvings, right, of base relief dwarves, and they have pipes in them as well to get ale. This is from the ancient dwarves. And then here we have one of these classic gags. These X's mark a spot pressure plate where you have uh, these giant barrels that flow down and smash into anyone who dares go into these two rooms. So here in 23B, you've got a classic atmosphere object that doesn't do anything magical. It doesn't have anything of value. These five dragons, uh, you've got a gold dragon here in the center, and then you've got a brass, bronze, copper, and silver. Uh, again, skeletons all assembled and mounted uh, just here for strictly for atmosphere. And in here you have this the, the character of Nadia, this berserker, uh, and her underlings. Here again, behind two secret doors, another arch gate. This one goes, you have to be the ninth level to go through, uh, which takes you to level six. And in 20D, you have these uh, armory where the, the, the bugbears all have these uh, various weapons, all dwarven uh, weapons from long ago. There you have the inanimate objects, anything of interest for this level. All right, so there you have putting objects on the second level of the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Uh, and as I say, I did this to show you how thinking about filling up your dungeon, some ideas that you're going to get from this in your own design. But as I've gotten from comments from players, hey, they want to run this in the Dungeon of the Mad Mage and it's helpful to them. So in the final video in this uh, second level series, I'm going to be talking about the composition of forces, uh, in this dungeon, the interrelations, now that you're on the second level, there's going to be level interrelations here, you know, Xanathar and some of these monsters, also the Revenant and some other things, uh, that as you go deeper, these connections become uh, more and more compelling, more important. But until then, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. And of course, what I really love to read are your comments. Uh, and most important, keep playing D&D &D and tell somebody else about it.